Well, I want to welcome you to the bridge, and you are smack dab in the middle of our Experiencing God series. And I pray that if you've been with us, that you are personally experiencing a life-transforming process. And if you're here today as a guest, I want to bring you up to speed where we are. Well, we're in Mr. Blackaby's book entitled Experiencing God as kind of a skeleton, if you will, for our series. We always live through God's word and God's book, but we're using Mr. Blackaby's outline of what he's called Experiencing God as kind of a a faith map to help us better understand the walk of Christianity. If you want to know how this relationship with Christ can press in and be more than simply a religion to hang your hat on, then you're in the right place. Mr. Blackaby has said that there are basically seven pillars in this experiencing God process that are universal for all of us, and I believe he's correct. He started off telling us that we need to understand that God is at work around us all the time. We said God works, that he's active, and if you'll develop a sensitivity to him and what he's doing and how he speaks, you would realize that you're never ever going to be more than just a snap away from joining God in what he's doing. We know this is true too because God is constantly pursuing us. He is forever knocking at the door of your heart saying, how about now? How about now? Will you join me now? Will you join me now? How about this? He is constantly knocking at the door of all of our hearts. Why? Because he wants to invite you into a personal, life-transforming, eternity-changing relationship. He's not inviting you to a religion. He's not asking you to put your, yourself under this big tent of religion. He's asking you into a personal, vibrant relationship with him. He says, I want you to know that I love you so much that I sent my son on purpose to come down and to die on the cross to offer you the gift of grace and eternal life. Would you please just say yes and accept my gift We know that he does this because we also know that God speaks. Many of you have seen in your lives, whether you've recognized it or not, or some of you are now recognizing it in ways that are just awe-inspiring, that God personally speaks. He speaks through the Bible. He speaks through your prayers. Sometimes he'll speak through circumstance. Lots of times he'll speak through other believers, what's known as the church. But God speaks universally. God also challenges, and that's where we're going to spend our time this morning. God will challenge you in what Mr. Blackaby calls a crisis of belief. Now, I've taken some liberty, and I've changed that to what I call a crisis of faith. And we're going to spend some time this morning looking at the difference between belief and faith, because I think this is one of those places where the definitions that we apply to the words make all the difference. You see, you can go into a number of churches, and you can hear the exact same language, But how many of you know that if you apply different definitions to the same words, you have a very different intent, which will lead to a very different outcome? And so this morning, in bridge fashion, I'm going to have us camp a little bit, down where the rubber meets the road, this place that we call real life, real deal difference making. Because if you don't understand the challenge that God is going to lay before you, there's a great likelihood that you will miss this and take the wrong turn at the fork in the road. Mr. Blackaby goes on, and we'll cover this in the next couple of weeks, to say that God also makes demands. Not only does he present challenges, but he makes demands. Now, that's my language, not his, but what he says is we're forced as believers oftentimes to make adjustments in our lives, significant adjustments sometimes. May alter some of the things that we believe, most likely it will. May alter our priorities may alter some of our relationships, may alter our use of time, resource, talents, a number of things. But know this, it's all worthwhile because in the end we know that God blesses. That for those who will say, yes, I'm giving my heart and my life over to Christ. I want him to not just be my savior. You see, a lot of religion sells the savior like Jesus is an insurance policy on eternity. So you can't get the Savior if you don't accept the Lord. And it's a matter of saying, yes, I'll take all of Jesus. I want him as both my Savior and my Lord. 
Well, this morning we're going to focus on one of these challenges, what Mr. Blackaby calls the crisis of belief. And I want to say this to you up front. Most of us have misinterpreted the word crisis. When I say crisis, I dare say that most of us would assume that that's connected to some form of a calamity. A crisis is a problem. Oh no, we're in crisis. Well, I want you to know the word crisis actually comes from a Greek word that means decision or judgment making. And so when you come to a crisis of belief or a crisis of faith, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden you're in this incredible storm and, oh no, what am I going to do? It simply means that you've been brought to a place where you need to make a decision. In the bridge language, those of you that call the bridge home know that we have what we call the life curve that shows the generic spiritual path of every life. And there comes a point where there's a huge drop-off. Now, in our language, my language, I call that the time where you have to choose whether or not you're going to go all in. See, you can be a Christian, and you can play it safe, and you can just barely get by. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15 talk about your work will be evaluated when you get to heaven. That God will take our lives, yours, mine, and everybody's, and he's going to say, okay, let's take a look at what came out of your life. Were you building while you were down there with stray, with straw and, and wood? Or were you doing things that were using fine, precious metals? We're going to apply the fire to it and see. Because if you wasted your time down there, everything that you did will be burnt up. If, however, you were pouring yourself out in the areas that mean the most, that will leave an eternal impact, then this fire will simply refine it and will see the gold that was your life. Now, the word tells us that there will be some whose lives will show that they spent it. They didn't invest their lives. They spent their lives on frivolous things. And the fire will burn it up. And the Bible says that they will enter into heaven. So hear me. You can get into heaven as a believer barely. The Bible says that those folks whose lives work was burnt up will enter into heaven as one escaping from the flames. You'll be smoking on your tush as you just slide in. Amen. Okay, that's, that's bridge language. That's real deal. The others will come in to a parade and a symphony. Well done. Well done. What a life. And so I'm here to tell you this morning, I want to talk about that difference. And here's the most important reason why. As a shepherd, as somebody who is going to be held responsible for your spiritual health to a certain degree, I want to make sure that we all walk into the parade. I want to make sure that you don't need a fire extinguisher as your first duty in heaven. But here's even the more important thing. And this is something that no preacher, no pastor, nobody can ever honestly say, I can tell you the difference between A and B. But here's the thing that I care most about. A lot of people think of themselves as a 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15 Christian. That's all right. All I need to do is get in and I'm good. And I'm here to tell you, if you're comfortable with that, you're probably not a genuine Christian. Do you hear me? That's tough language. I'm not saying you are or you are not. Only God knows and only you know. But I can tell you this. Somebody who is comfortable and says, I'll be fine, that's good enough, is at great risk of being self-delusional. You're deceiving yourself. You're being deceived. And I want you to know that the devil is rooting you on. That's right, you're fine. Leave it alone. Who's that pompous jerk up on the stage think he is? Don't tell me. I'm not telling you. Only you and the Lord knows. But I have a great concern that Matthew 7, 21 through 23 is going to come to roost on a lot of people who are going to be shocked at the gates of eternity. You see, Jesus said that many on that day will say to me, Lord, Lord, but did we not? And here's my laundry list of things that I did for you. I even had evidence that I was busy working for you. And Jesus says, on that day, I will say to you, away from me, for I never knew you, you evildoers. You don't have to worry about that if you're one of those folks whose lives is going to be leading to the parade in heaven. 
And so I want to encourage all of us to get out of the good is good enough mindset and to live for Christ. Now to do that, it requires a life devoted to him. It requires a life of faith. And that's why where Mr. Blackaby says, there will come a time for every believer where there will be this crisis of belief. My language, crisis of faith. I think it's absolutely critical that we understand the difference. Because there are a lot of folks that believe in a God, small g. There's a lot of people that will sit in a church like this and say, I believe in God, capital G. I want you to know the devil believes in God too and he won't spend any time in heaven. The demons, the underbelly, you can believe in your head in the reality of God and spend eternity separated from him. We've got to understand the difference between believism and faith. Let me read to you a quote from Mr. Blackaby's work. Those of you that are going through the study with us will come into this this coming week. He says this, Anytime God leads you to do something that has God-sized dimensions, you will face a crisis of belief. At that point, what you do next reveals what you really believe about God. Here's the rubber hitting the road. When God invites you to join him in his work, he has a God-sized assignment for you. You will quickly realize that you cannot do what he is asking on your own. If God doesn't help you, you will fail. This is the crisis of belief, when you must decide whether to believe God for what he wants to do through you or not. At this point, many people decide to follow their instincts and walk away from God. Then they wonder why they do not experience God's presence and activity the way other Christians do. That's where the rubber hits the road. I want to show you a video that contextualizes this difference between believing and living by faith. Again, in the church world, on the street, the words have become almost synonymous, almost interchangeable. And in their purest sense, that's okay. But as is the case so often nowadays, we have perverted and hijacked words and applied twisted and different meanings to them, typically so that they'll fit what we want instead of being applied to God's truth. Let me show you a little video about a fella from the past that helps us to understand this difference. Welcome to the amazing Blondin. the early 1900s. There's no iPod, there's no Xbox, there's no internet, there's no big screen movies, there's no entertainment. But you know somebody's going to provide something fun to look at. So back in those days, before television and before all the things that we do to entertain ourselves, they had spectacles. And people would come out in the droves and thousands to see people do amazing stunts, kind of pre-jackass kinds of stuff. And there was a guy from France named the Amazing Blondin, and his shtick was that he would stretch a tightrope from New York to Canada over the Niagara Falls area, and he would go across. And every day he would go across, the crowds would get larger. And he would do the same thing. I'm the Amazing Blondin. Do you believe in me? Can I cross this tightrope? And people would yell, we believe in you. And, you know, they're sick. They, they want to... They want to see him fall, but they believe in him. So he would walk across the tightrope, and every day he would do something a little different, carrying people, stopping to drink wine, these types of things. And he would do the same thing. He would stop and say, I'm blonde, and do you believe in me? And they would say, yes, we do. One day he gets a wheelbarrow, and he puts it on the tightrope. He walks it across throws his hands up and says, I'm blonde and do you believe in me? And the crowd roared with approval. Yes, we do. Do you believe I can take it back? Yes, we do. And then he said, who will get in the wheelbarrow? And it got really quiet. The news report said that no one wanted to get in because you see, people believed that he could do it, but they weren't willing to 
to trust themselves in the wheelbarrow. As you might imagine, what's happening here is people believe in their head that it can happen, but they're not thinking that, that they want to be personally involved because they're not really so certain. Because they'd have to place their faith and their trust in this, this character named Blondin. And faith in the Bible is this theme that goes all the way through it, from the old to the new. But we think about faith as being for places like this, for places of worship. You know, if, if faith is for this life, it's for Sunday morning for a lot of people. Or that faith is just not about this world at all. It's about for when you die, that you go someplace nice instead of someplace hot. That faith isn't really for this life. But the Bible talks a lot about faith as being not merely in our head, not just believing that God exists, but entrusting ourselves to him. That faith is, is actually getting into the wheelbarrow. John writes in his book about Jesus, and he writes this in the first chapter. He says, Yet to all who received him, to all who received him, there's this idea of receiving Jesus and, and getting him personally involved. In a sense, it's like saying, you can be president of the country that's called me. I want to receive you into my life to be, to be the king. It says, to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, who believed in him. That's that idea of having faith. And we think, well, gosh, you know, I believe in God, but it's more than that. It's about entrusting ourselves. The wording means more than just believing your mind. It means entrusting yourself. It says, to those who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, to have a new and fresh relationship with God that comes through not believing that he exists so that he can get us to heaven or something. It's entrusting ourselves to him in the today, and for today-to-day -day life. When I first got married, my wife and I had a little baby and we found out really quickly that having a baby is an expensive deal. And being a young couple, we never had quite enough money. And one day we got to the point where we did all our bills and gave some money to church and did everything we needed to do financially. And I said, it's time to go shopping for the next two weeks of groceries. And, hey, honey, how much do we have left? And she said, we've got 20 bucks left for two weeks. And, you know, diapers and, I mean, food's expensive. Baby food's expensive. And I'm thinking, what are we going to do? I mean, God, I need you to show up. I needed to have trust in him then. I needed to get in the wheelbarrow because I didn't have any way to motivate myself and deal with the issue. I didn't have any more money. So I had to entrust myself in this life. I had to trust and believe that God would take care of us. So strangely, we went to the store. We got out of the store, pulled out a shopping cart, found a brand new, crisp, $100 bill sitting floating on that first bar of the shopping cart. We went and asked the manager, what do we do? Somebody lost some money. And he said, you know what? We don't hold it. You hold it. And if nobody claims it in a week, it's yours. And, and guess what? We went prepared to buy as much Top Ramen, mac and cheese, baby food, diapers as we could with 20 bucks. And it ran out in about a week. And when I called the manager, he said, nobody's claimed that money. You know, God doesn't go around doing that stuff every day. But our trust in him, just to drive to the store and say, God, we're, we're going to need you to show up, proved to be worthy. It didn't help us that we believed that God existed. It helped us to entrust ourselves to him, to drive to the store, believing that God would, one way or another, take care of us because we're his children, like John says. And that's the story of faith. Faith is about trusting it's about allowing God to steer our lives. Believing in God isn't enough. Entrusting ourselves to him is. That's my story. You see a difference between believism and faith. Biblical faith takes action and commitment. Hebrews 11.1, 1, which if you're familiar with your Bible, you would recognize that chapter is often known as the Hall of Fame of Faith. It starts off by saying faith is being sure of what we do not know and see. It, it's having an understanding that I don't have to touch it to, to know that it's so if God said so. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says we do not walk by sight but that we walk by faith. And here's my favorite. In terms of the, the understanding of God's view of faith, Isaiah 7, 9 says that if you will not stand strong on your faith, you will not stand at all. 
If you won't stand up for what you know God has said, when it's time for the rubber to hit the road, it doesn't matter all the talk. All the hot air will go away. If you won't stand up for your faith in God, capital G, you won't stand up for anything. Tough talk, Pastor Jeff. Not my words. Not my words. But let me take you one step further because this is so key to understand the difference between believism and faith. There's a gentleman whose little clip I found on the internet and I want to share it with you because I think he's done a profound job of expounding upon what this gentleman just said and understanding that faith, today that word has been so trampled upon, it's been so cheapened that even to call it believism doesn't do it justice. Today it's just that religious lingo. But really to understand biblical faith, it's to understand that we need to trust, to trust God, not just acknowledge and believe, but to trust. I want you to take a look at this. The title, it's only a two-minute clip. It's called Faith. What is it? Let this permeate into your heart, and then we'll pick up, and we're going to go into God's Word. I actually don't like the word faith. I think it's mischaracterized and misused now in the English. It's the English translation of a, of a, a Greek word that means something different than what people usually mean now. When you say the word faith now, it's too easy for people to attach some extra words to it, like blind or leap of. And so I think the word faith in the English has been, b- become corrupted from its original purpose of conveying what the Bible has in mind. I suggest a, a different word in English that really captures what the uh, New Testament concept had in mind, and that word is simply trust. Because you realize trust is something that needs to be earned. It's based generally in some kind of foundational knowledge or information. You have an experience with someone, knowledge of their capability, and therefore you place your trust in them. This is exactly what the New Testament identifies. And when the apostles went out to reflect the teachings of Jesus, indeed when Jesus himself did that, he gave information, did works of power to demonstrate the legitimacy of that information that invited people on the basis of those things to put their trust in him. That's what biblical faith or belief is. It isn't just an intellectual acknowledgement. It's an awareness of the truth of something and a willingness to act because you've been so convinced of the truthfulness of this. And if anybody's a little uncertain as to whether this is really the biblical uh, approach to things, Just look at the way John characterizes his own writing in his gospel. At the end of the gospel, he says why he wrote the gospel. He says many other things Jesus has done that's not included in these books, but these things, these signs and wonders, miracles, have been included in order that you would believe that Jesus is the Son of God and in believing have life in his name. John is willing to write an entire gospel giving evidence so that people will put their active trust in Jesus as Savior and in so doing then have the eternal life that comes from investing your trust in Christ. That's, I think, the best definition of biblical faith, active trust. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Do you see the difference? You can walk through life believing in religion, thinking that you're well insulated, and all the while, be totally disconnected from God. It's about the relationship, not the religion. To understand what the Bible says is to really embrace this. And here again, I'm going to challenge you. But faith cannot be an auxiliary add-on to the Christian life. It, it is not a, you know, a, a peripheral issue. It's not the caboose that you put onto your Christian train. It is the heartbeat of your relationship with God. To not walk by faith is to walk in disobedience to God's instructions. And to walk in faith is to actively, intentionally trust him in the things that you cannot see. The things that he has already said in his word and those things that he may have spoken into your heart. Some of you know what it is to have been called into a ministry. Some of you have heard God's voice. He's given you instruction and direction, perhaps a promise. In the Old Testament, we see Abraham and Sarah. God says, I'm going to give you a child. 
they look and Abraham says, I'm so old. And Sarah says, I'm barren. I'm way old. And they say, okay, well, God made us a promise. You know what we need to do? It's not happening. Well, of course it's not happening. Look at, look at our circumstances. It's impossible. Sarah says, well, I know what I'll do. I'll grab the reins and I'll make it happen. Here, Abraham, lay with this servant girl. And sure enough, she gets pregnant. Ishmael is born. And Sarah says, look, I helped God. He said it would be so. I got active, made some things happen, and now you have a child, just like God said. God said, that's not my child that I promised you. I promised you a child with Sarah, and it will come. There's a huge sin in the world today. Uh, Take the reins, I'll do it myself sin. I'll make it happen sin. God says, if I tell you, if I promise, I will take care of it. It will come. Trust me. Walk by faith. We say walk by faith and we think, okay, be religious. Be a good person. That's not it. It's walk trusting God at every turn with the big things and the little things. Jesus said this in Luke 646, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do what I say? The implied message, I am only Lord to those who truly do what I say. Again, back to Matthew 7, 21 through 23. On that day, there will be many who will say to me, Lord, Lord, but did I not? And there he makes it clear that your heart has to be right and your choices And when it comes down to what you truly believe about God, whether or not it's biblical faith, your actions and your heart will give your answers. And if they differ from what comes out of your mouth, your actions and your heart trump your lips. That's the challenge that all of us face, is to become congruent so that our actions and our hearts are aligned with what we say and what we imply. Let me take you to God's word in Matthew chapter 14. To me, perhaps the greatest encounter of a crisis of belief or a crisis of faith in all the Bible. Some of you know this as the place where Jesus walks on water. Matthew 14, I want to share with you verses 22 through 33. And as I read them, I just want to point some things out and show the application that applies to us. Okay, first of all, to give you some context, this is where Jesus has just finished feeding the 5,000. With a little bit of bread and a couple of fish, he feeds 5,000. Now, why was he there? He had just heard that John the Baptist had been beheaded. And the Bible says, upon hearing that, he wanted to get alone and pray. First point of application to us, we need quality time alone with God. We need that quality time alone in prayer with God. Bible says that Jesus goes there to get alone. The people who have been so inspired and so amazed to see what God was doing in and through the people around him, that they followed him. So he gets there, and he can't have that quiet time alone with God. 5,000 men, so adding women and children, are there. We see the miracle that is his feeding of them. He finishes, and this is where we now pick up. They've just fed the 5,000, and now we pick up in uh, verse 22 of Matthew 14. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. First point, how do you like the word immediately? Made them. How do we feel when God says, you, now, there? Truth be known, we don't like it a whole lot. If we're honest, most of us don't like being told what to do. Even if it's God. We like to kind of warm up to ideas. We like them to be our ideas. We like to have them on our own. And we certainly like to cozy up to them in our timing. Immediately, he made them. That's like saying, not now, right now. Well, I'm here to tell you that if God has tapped you on the shoulder and he has said immediately, you better get jumping. Amen. You don't have to. See, this is one of the beautiful things about Christianity and about our God. He doesn't force anybody. He'll give you what you want. He'll honor your wishes. You don't want to obey? 
fine. There will be consequences, but you pick. Remember Blackaby's quote? Many turn away at this point because they don't want to go all in. But then they wonder why it is that I don't get to experience God the way that person is experiencing God. Because he's honoring your wishes. Whoa. Let's go on. After that, he had dismissed them. He went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Get this. Often missed. He's going to pray. He's going to get alone with God. He went there for the purpose. He has 5,000 people come. He feeds them, does all these miracles. People experience God, and it's amazing. Takes care of that. He dismisses the crowd, and then he goes, he's still going to get alone with God. Don't let even the best of things that may draw you away pull you away from your quality time with God. There's a lot of good getting in the way of best. Quality time with God is essential, as Jesus shows us. He said, when evening came... He was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. They left, they obeyed, they're going across to the other side of the lake, and the storm rises. This is awful. It's white caps everywhere, big giant storm, and the boat's way out there. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. Crisis of belief. Get a load of this. Imagine if now in the middle of this sermon I were to just walk out and stand over the projector. You'd freak out. <laughs> you would freak out. Rightfully so. But I'm not Jesus. They were in the presence of the Son of God. First crisis of belief, what do you do when you see God do something in your life that is absolutely miraculous? Some of you have been there, some of you haven't, and you will be. I dare say most of you have probably seen God work in that kind of way. You may not have given him credit, but he's probably shown you some form of his miraculous self at some point in your life. But here's the first crisis. What do you do when you see God move? Here's what the disciples did. Now remember, these are his disciples, those closest to him. Those in whom he's been pouring himself out. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. There's a very real chance that if and when you see God move in your life, it may scare you. Take heart, friends. Don't be afraid. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Now in the grammatical context, take courage is not an option. It's a command. Take courage. Again, to not walk by faith is to walk in disobedience. But Jesus says in the midst of the fear, Take courage, for it is I. Don't be afraid. If it's you, Peter replied, and I love Peter. One of the things I love about uh, Jim, who leads the worship, I told him this week, he's got a Peter's heart. I love that. He's an ear whopper, you know? We walk by faith. It's a guy that shows up in the garden, and when the Roman guards come, he draws a sword, and he's going to charge. Some of you have that same heart. I love it. Peter says, I love this. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Now let me ask you this. Do you need to have believism in order to ask that question? Or is that real faith? If you see the Lord out there and you say, hey, call me out there. Let me come to you. You don't ask that question if you're kind of so-so on whether or not he's the real deal. Peter has it in his heart. And get a load of this because this is your verse, my friends. Many of you have said, to Jesus, when he has called you out to something impossible, bigger than you, something that is truly God-sized. Lord, if it's really you, then call me out. Jesus says, come. No more, no less. Come. Doesn't need to say anymore. This is God we're talking about. Come. Then Peter got down out of the boat. I love this. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. That's verse 29. Come. 
Then Peter got out. John Ortberg wrote a book, said if you want to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat. Some of you have been through that uh, small group program with us. Peter says, okay. Now, some of you that know this story know where we're going to go. I want to challenge you right now because this account is often thought of as one of Peter's shortcomings. I want to challenge your paradigm if that's where you're coming from. God encounters him. He sees the living Christ walking on the water. He has it in his heart to believe with a biblical faith. And he says, if it's you, Lord, call me out. Jesus says, come. Peter says, good enough for me. Climbs out of the boat and then listen to these words. Walked on the water. How many other people do you know that have walked on the water in this life? Peter walked on the water. You want to know why? Because he walked towards God in obedient, faithful response to come. I pray that those of you that are asking God to show you what he has for you, that you are listening and that you are willing to climb out of the boat, that you are willing to get in the wheelbarrow not just stand on the sideline and applaud. Oh, this is wonderful, wonderful. What an exhibition. I have no doubt that that person has truly had a changed life. I pray that you, like Peter, will climb out of the boat and walk on the water that is the impossible in your life. Because you see, what God calls you to if you don't need to have his presence, he probably hasn't called you to it. So many of us can play it safe. We can be in the religious circles. We can do a bunch of really sweet and nice things. Oh, you know, I'm going to Africa to feed a bunch of kids some sandwiches because they have swollen bellies, and I hate to see the kids starving. I say, great, what are you going to do about Jesus? Well, I don't know. They don't like that because they say apparently there are some groups that they, they get a little offended if you start talking Jesus. But we're going to give them a billion sandwiches. I said, great, you just rearranged the deck furniture on the Titanic. Does that make you feel good? Yeah, bring sandwiches. But bring them the Jesus that'll change their eternity so that you don't just make their bellies go down, but you bring them to heaven. If God isn't in it, if you can do it easily, it's probably religion in action. Do you want to know why the world is so easily dissuaded from coming to Christ? Because so few people in the world see Christ. They see a lot of church. They see a lot of Christian activity. But one of the things I love about what Mr. Blackaby has put together with experiencing God is he says they don't need Christianity in terms of a boxed religion. They need Christ you want to know why they're not responding? Because they're not seeing Christ. They're seeing a bunch of nice people do nice things. Let them see Christ in action, and he will draw them to himself. Listen to what happens as the passage continues. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, oh... That darn wind. We all have wind in our lives. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith. He said, why did you doubt he says, you saw me walking on the water. You saw me just feed 5,000 with five loaves of bread and a couple of fish. You actually distributed it. You walked on the water. Why in the world would you let a little wind throw you off? You of little faith. Now mind you, there is absolutely no question about Peter's believing in Jesus. 
He believed in him when he asked him to call him out. He believed in him when he climbed out of the boat. He certainly believed in him when he was walking on the water. What's the application for us? He stopped trusting him midstream. Many of you have begun to walk with God. And it's starting to get a little hot. It's starting to get a little tough. Well, I'm here to tell you a little heads up. On Easter Sunday, we're going to begin a new series called The End. We're going to go into the book of Revelation. And we're going to spend some serious time looking at end time prophecy. If you don't feel like that wind is on you now, you better get ready because it's coming. Jesus said, I showed you. I drew you. I actually empowered you to walk on water. You're midstream and you get distracted by the wind? Are you serious? The application for us is to not let the storms of life draw us away. To not allow the wind, the struggles, the difficult circumstances to take our faith, our trust away from the one true risen Lord. Peter did and he paid a price. He began to sink. This shows us that faith is not a one-time thing. You become a Christian when you truly give your heart to Christ. That is a moment instantaneous thing. But walking by faith is a day in, day out, hour by hour, minute by minute process. And know this, the devil is going to track you like a hungry bear. The Bible says like a lion looking to devour you. All you got to do is lay up just a little. I'm just going to hit cruise control for a little bit here. Wham! He will hit you like you can't even imagine. And you will sink. Don't let it happen. Don't lose sight of the fact that the God who has called you, who has empowered you to do your water walking is not going to let that wheelbarrow fall. Climb into the wheelbarrow. You see, James tells us in chapter 2, verse 26, that faith without works, without action that corresponds, is a dead faith. You can't say it and not live it and have it be valid. When it comes to what we truly believe about God, our actions are our answers. Not what we say. Many of us know how to fill in the blank with all the right answers. But unless you're willing to live in the wheelbarrow unless you're willing to walk on water if that's what God calls you to. You're going to end up walking in a very frustrated, very fallen world where I dare say you may not find peace or joy. You'll live in a place that is almost like a hell on earth. Some of you say, well, Pastor Jeff, I'm, I am walking by faith, and I still feel like it's a hell on earth. Well, I'm big on truth and advertising. I told you about Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of fame of faith. This is where the Bible calls out some of the greatest examples of those who lived in this personal trusting relationship, no matter what, with God. If you read Hebrews chapter 11 and you get down to verses 33 through 35, what you will find is exactly what you would expect you'll see some of the examples of victorious living and God's blessing and how it was like the skies opened up for those people who live by faith. But if you read the second half of verse 35 through 38, you're going to find something that might shock you. You're going to find people who were equally lifted up as positive examples of living by faith. Great Hall of Fame faith people in incredible persecution being murdered for what they believed, living in the midst of trial and difficulty. Say, well, that's not the way it's supposed to be. I did everything right. I said yes to God. Where's the gravy train? Where's the smooth sailing? That's not a part of the promise. 
In verse 40, God says, I'll tell you how and why you live this way. Because at the end of this very short time span that you spend down here on this earth, in this life, I will give you forever in relationship and in close proximity to me in heaven. And yeah, some people down here, they're going to have this life where the walk of faith looks smooth and easy. And others are going to be called to lay down a life that is very, very difficult. It doesn't matter. And whether or not you live on one side or the other of that equation makes no difference. The issue is, again, your actions and your heart. You see, faith is a world that could be very deceiving. A lot of what looks to be great faith is phony faith. In a lot of places where it looks like there is no faith, there's tremendous faith. I'll tell you how this comes out in the context of real life. You may see some enormous churches with giant crowds of religious people where there is little to no relationship with Christ. Where like cattle marching up to eternity's gates, they're going to hear, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. And then there are others, maybe we drove by all kinds of motorcycle crowds on our way down to Florida. There was bike week in Daytona. And I, I would tell you, I have no doubt that there are some tremendous ministries happening in the context of that bike week. People that if they walked up to you down the street in our community, they'd probably frighten you. That had such a passionate love affair with Jesus who had lived a committed life to go into those places because they said, that's where I fit. That's where I belong. I'm God's instrument there. And they're on fire for Jesus. Don't let the outside throw you. A church is not a church is not a church. A Christian is not a Christian is not a Christian. It comes down to the definitions that we apply. It comes down to the life we live not the life we describe. There's going to come a time where all of us will have a crisis of faith. Jesus is going to call you to a turning point, to a fork in the road, and they will come frequently in your life. The question becomes, do I want to walk with God and if need be, make some major adjustments in my life Am I going to let him be Lord? Or am I going to try to hold on to this and steer things my way and get him to fit in the world that I want to make? If he's calling you to God-sized things, it's going to have to be done God's way. Good news for you is twofold. A, he won't force you to follow him. So if you want to go your own way, you can. The other thing is he'll constantly, constantly, knock at the door of your heart to say, would you please let me in? Because I know the end of the story and you will be far better off if you come with me. I pray that as all of us come to our place where we find a crisis of faith, that our actions will scream out the message of our heart, which is to say, yes, Jesus I want to close with one last provocative thought. In the Christian life, there are two words that you cannot put together. You cannot put these two words together. Not if you're going to uphold any type of intellectual integrity. You can never put no and Lord together. If you find yourself in a crisis of belief and you've heard the Lord speak to your heart, you cannot say no, Lord, and continue on saying that he is your Lord. You can go the way you want, but you'll walk away from the one true living Lord. Please, please, please say yes. Please. Would you pray with me? Lord, we come as those who know your blessing in large part 
for having been called. We have heard your voice. We see your hand. We know that you are active in our midst. Many, Lord, I see where you are so dynamically involved in lives. I thank you that you have opened up our eyes, that the eyes of our heart see you. I thank you for the clarity of truth. I thank you, Lord, that we don't leave with some ambiguous religious message that, uh, that just sends us out into life without a real understanding of either the dangers or the blessings that you have so clearly laid out for us. I pray that we will be a people of love and light. Those who come to these turning points and forks in the road, fully committed with a no matter what heartbeat to say, yes, Lord, thank you. Lord, be with us until we come back again. Multiply our light that others will know you in a way that will impact eternity. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.